you are listening to By the Book, because if you don't look at the world through the Bible, you will never see it right. This is Alan Griffith, your host for episode 37 of By the Book. We're glad you're with us today. Hope you're with us every week. We've been talking about marriage and family, and there's no need to spend a lot of time discussing how bad things are in this country when it comes to that topic. And of course, marriage is the foundation of the family. So a marriage has to be right. You know, not not uh, too long ago, we had uh, another mass shooting, and and these things are absolute tragedies. And people talk about, you know, gun control and a variety of things. But I want to tell you something. Uh, the problem in this country, the reason this country is falling apart is because we have walked away from God, and we have walked away from God, especially in the area of marriage and family. And I might pursue that more uh, in another episode. Uh, today, I want to turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. We were in Ephesians 5 last time, and uh, there's good discussion there, good teaching there from the Apostle Paul. We come to 1 Peter 3, and we find Peter takes up the subject of marriage, and he's got some powerful things to say, and so we want to talk about them uh, here today. So open your Bible if you can, 1 Peter chapter 3, and Peter begins with this in verse 1. He says, Likewise, Ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Now, that's the same challenge that we found in Ephesians 5, and that's really the heart of truth from all the way back in Genesis 2, when God first created Adam and Eve, brought them together in a marriage. The man was obviously to serve God. The woman was created to be the helper. Well, there has to be a leader. The man has to be the leader of the home. And there's a real problem with that today, not just because of gals often wanting to call the shots, but because men won't stand up and lead. Now, the challenge, interestingly, both in Ephesians 5 and here in 1 Peter 3, begins with a word to the wife. And that might almost seem unfair. I think if I was just writing something of my own accord, I think I'd say, well, the man needs to step up. The man needs to be what he ought to be, and I'm going to talk to him first. But God, through leading Paul and Peter, sends the message to the wife first. And he says, again, here in 1 Peter 3 and verse 1, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Understand his God-appointed role. Yield to that and put yourself under his leadership. You rank under him. That's God's plan. But you know, Peter does something for us that Paul did not do. And what Peter does is he gives us some understanding of why. And I think there are many ladies who might ask that question, why? Why do I have to put myself into subjection to my husband? Well, listen to what Peter says. The verse goes on. He says, that if any obey not the word. The idea is, if any husbands, if your husband doesn't obey the word, your husband is not the man he ought to be. Your husband does not uh, lead your family. Your husband does not have a, a close enough walk with God. Uh, maybe your husband is not leading you in, in worship and going to church and being faithful. There's so many things we could talk about, but you as a wife might look at your husband and say, well, no, my husband does not obey the word. Now, if you're the husband, start obeying the word. Start being the man God wants you to be. It's not so much the man your wife wants you to be, it's the man that God wants you to be, and if you'll be that man, you'll satisfy the needs, desires of your wife. But listen to what Peter is saying to the wife. You subject yourself to your husband, and the idea is if this guy is not obeying the word, 
The verse goes on, they also, the husband also, may without the word be one. Now that's important. Your husband doesn't obey the word of God. He's not the man he ought to be. Would you like to win him? Would you like to see him changed? Peter's message is this to the wife. You cannot change him. Only God can change him. I remember a teacher I sat under for uh, a number of times coming to our church, and here's what he said to the ladies. He said about the husband, you make him happy, God will make him holy. That's a good exhortation. You cannot make him holy. You need to be careful about trying to make him holy. Listen to the verse again. If any obey not the word, they may, they also may without the word be one. Now that doesn't mean your husband is going to be one without the word of God. It means he's going to be one without your word. Sometimes ladies think they can nag their husbands into being what they ought to be. Well, let me tell you something. If your husband changes because you nag him, you still have a man who isn't walking with God. He's just tired of being nagged. He's given in. He's given in to your pressure. That is not what you want. But Peter's giving hope. If this man doesn't obey the word, he can be one. But without your words, well, how's he going to be one? The verse concludes, by the, here's an old English word, by the conversation of the wives. That term conversation means uh, the life you live, your behavior. What's, what's the picture? And listen, this is no easy situation. I think the wife's role is the most difficult in the family, to be sure. What a challenge. Men have trouble surrendering to Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ never does anything wrong. He never makes a mistake. He never goes astray. And yet God comes and talks to the lady and says, now you need to be in submission to this man who is going to do things wrong, who is going to make a mistake. And yet you are to put yourself into subjection to him. Why? Why? Why get under him even when he's messing the whole thing up? Because God can win him through your life, through your behavior. Be a great wife. He may not be worthy of it. Many times we men are not worthy of the respect of our wives. We are not worthy of our wives submitting to us. But the message of God to the wife is, you put yourself in subjection, whether he seemingly deserves it or not. Don't nag him get out of the way so that I, God, can work on him. And that's the idea. Get out of the way. Let God deal with him. Now, I know there's a lot of frustration in that because wives will say, yeah, but you never know what my husband's going to do. I don't know what he's going to buy. I don't know what he's going to uh, do or how he's going to act. Not, not easy. Uh, my wife and I often talk about the first Peter three wives that we have known, uh, a standout was my wife's aunt who lived for years with a man who was unsaved, but she was a great wife. And it took to his last days, just six weeks, as I recall, before he passed away, that he came to Christ. But she said it was worth it all, and it was. And I, I won't go into the detail of how he treated her unkindly, how he failed to treat her the right way. But that lady, once she came to Christ, lived for Christ, great wife, and today, well, she's in heaven now today, and her husband is in heaven today because of her testimony. God can change your husband. And you might say, I don't think my husband is changeable. God can change your husband. Now, I, I confess the difficulty is you are under your husband. So if the pressure comes on him from God, you may feel some of that pressure. But that's God's testimony. 
And it's wonderful because it is not simply wife being subjection to your husband and too bad, who knows what's going to happen. No, the message is when you put yourself into subjection to your husband, God is now free to work on him. Sometimes men come up with uh, with ideas, whatever it might be, and the wife is thinking, this is terrible. Well, one of the best things you can do is say this to your husband. Now, you can make an appeal. You can tell your husband, well, honey, here's why I don't think this is the best idea. This is what I think could go wrong. But after you make your appeal, then you back off and you say this to your husband. But honey, that is between you and the Lord. And you can say that to him even if he's unsaved. You can say it if he's a man who is backslidden, and you can surely say it to a man who's seeking to walk with God. But when you get out of the way, and that man, when he looks up, doesn't see you standing over him, you're out of the way. He looks up and he sees God standing over him, and you tell him that's between you and the Lord. That puts you on safe ground. That puts you in a place of hope. Now, your husband in that situation still may make the bad choice, but you have put the situation before God, and God is now able to work. Verse 2 says this, While they, while the husbands, behold your, the wife, your chaste conversation, your godly, pure conversation, the verse goes on, coupled with fear, not fear of your husband, fear of the Lord. When a man sees his wife walking with God, oh, for a time he may just go ahead and do his own thing. But when a man sees his wife walking with God, that is what will bring the conviction of God into that man's life. Now, Peter has some other things to say to the wife. And ladies, this is good information today. And I just want to pass it on to you. Listen to verse 3. He's talking to the wife and he says this, Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning. And I'm going to stop there for a moment. Your adorning, what's that mean? Well, it's actually the term uh, world. It's a rendering of the term cosmos. Your, it, it's your world. That's a good way to put it. And the idea of it is, uh, what, what about you is uh, the testimony to people? What do people see or think about when they see you as a Christian woman? What is it that you are doing to establish your testimony of who you are before your wife, be, or before your husband, before your family, whoever it might be? Well, here's what Peter says. He says, who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning. It's not the outward person. And then he gives three illustrations. Not the outward adorning of plaiting, P-L-A-I-T-I-N-G, plaiting the hair. That means uh, bending, curling, folding, whatever ladies do with their hair. Don't let your hair be the thing that stands out about you. Now, that sounds funny. Uh, But sometimes uh, we tease about going to a church and we talk about a certain lady and say, there's the lady with the hair. Because her hair is done in such a way that that's what stands out about her. And I guess sometimes it looks nice, sometimes it doesn't look so nice. But I always always say this, don't be the lady with the hair. Don't be, when somebody talks about you and they're, they're trying to direct somebody to you, if they say, oh, you'll know her, that's the lady with the hair, you're you're messing it up. Take care of your hair. It doesn't mean you have to have it under a bonnet. Nobody ever sees it. Uh, let your hair be, be properly cared for. Let it be nice, whatever it might be. But that shouldn't be what stands out about you. And then he said, also, a wearing of gold. Now, there are some groups, you know, who don't believe that women should wear gold. They shouldn't wear jewelry. That's not what this verse is saying. This verse is not saying that a lady should not wear jewelry, but, but it is saying this. It is saying that your jewelry should not be what stands out about you, and your jewelry should not be, in a sense, uh, you know, your testimony. Uh, I get in trouble with this sometimes, I guess, but I think it's okay for a a lady to have uh, earrings or whatever. But, you know, when she's got six earrings in her 
ear. She's got something stuck in her nose. She's got something stuck in her tongue. Let me tell you, there's something wrong. There's something wrong with that. Uh, wear jewelry, if you will. Let it be modest, but don't let your jewelry be, oh yeah, she's the one with, no, not that. And then he goes on and says, or the putting on of apparel, your clothes. Uh, clothes are very important, obviously, but they are a part of your testimony. What you wear is a part of your testimony. And uh, your husband should be, you know, the one who who guides you and, and uh, lets you know how he feels about it. But, you know, a woman is supposed to be modest. She's supposed to be modest. And uh, she needs to be careful what she wears. And I'm not going to get into the detail of that. I'm just going to say to you, you need to be modest because you don't want people to look at you and say, oh, yeah, there's that Christian lady. Look at her hair. Look at her jewelry. Look at her clothes. Oh, no, not that. Listen to what Peter goes on to say in verse 4. He says, but let it. In other words, let what I'm going to talk about next be your world. Let this be what stands out about you. Let this be what establishes your testimony. Here's what he says. Let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Don't put the emphasis on the external. Let the emphasis be on the internal the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Ladies, that's a challenge. That's a challenge. A meek and quiet spirit. Uh, What is meekness? Uh, Meekness is not weakness. I'm sure you've heard that. Meekness is where a person is willing to surrender what might otherwise be their rights, but for this cause, for the greater spiritual cause. I don't have to have it my way because I want to, in this situation, magnify Christ. I think of the Lord Jesus, uh, meek and lowly. You know, the Lord Jesus could have come down off that cross, couldn't he? In fact, he didn't have to go to the cross in his own power, but he could have come down from that cross. They mocked him. They laughed at him. He could have come down from that cross any moment, but he didn't. Why? Because he was there for the most incredible spiritual uh, message that could possibly be given. He sacrificed himself. Wife, that's that's your meekness. Sometimes people want to demand their rights. I should have the right to, and, and probably sometimes we should have the right. But meekness says I can yield that because there's a greater cause. And for you, it's your husband and your children. So he says the wife needs to have a meek spirit and a quiet spirit. Why is that important? Because husbands can drive ladies crazy. Husbands, again, can can uh, not lead at all or lead in the wrong direction or, again, come up with crazy ideas. They want to do their own thing. They're selfish, whatever it might be. I understand to some degree my, my own sinfulness as, as a husband. And that is why the wife needs to beg God for a quiet spirit. Lord, I can't control what's going on. I need you to give me a quietness within. Now, those two terms, meek and quiet spirit, are what Peter challenges the wife to manifest in order to be a great testimony for Christ. The lady's role is not easy. And that's why I think Peter comes back and Paul came back then to the man And I want to tell you that the problem today in Christian homes is not the lady. Ladies aren't perfect, but the problem is men. Men who won't be the leaders they ought to be. Men who will not walk with God. Men who will not get into the word of God. Men who will not stand for God, live for God. That's the problem. But ladies, your challenge is submit yourself to him. 
that God might bring the conviction and the pressure on him. Now, we don't have much time. In fact, I'm going to close here. We're going to come back with this next time and move on to see a little bit more about the wife. But then uh, I want to bring from the scriptures the challenge home to, to myself and to every single one of us men. Lord bless you. Till next time.